So an atrial septal defect is an example of an acyanotic heart condition. Uh, you can see an example over here uh, on the right side of an atrial septal defect. It's a, again, a left to right shunt um, through from the left atrium to the right atrium. And uh, blood will naturally flow uh, in this direction because there's increased uh, pressure in the left atrium compared to the right atrium. So it's flowing down that pressure gradient. And uh, we'll note that this is due to a failure of the interatrial septum to close. Um, and you'll recall from embryology that there's two types of atrial septal defects. Uh, there's a secundum type, which is actually um, the more common type. And that's due to incomplete growth uh, of the septum secundum or uh, too much resorption of the septum primum. Uh, and then there's also the primum type of ASD, which is due to the failure of the septum primum uh, to fuse with the endocardial cushions as it grows downwards. Um, and how do we identify these patients? Uh, a fixed, widely split S2 is going to be a very classic symptom of ASD. Uh, and let's explain physiologically why this happens. So uh, you'll recall from normal physiology that in a normal person, when you take a deep breath, you have a drop in uh, intrathoracic pressure. And then you have, uh, as a result of that, increased venous return uh, through the vena cava into the right atrium. And as a result, you have a uh, increased venous return into the right ventricle and the increased volume of blood being pumped out into the pulmonary artery. And that increased amount of blood uh, will mean that it takes longer to pump out. And uh, as a result, the pulmonic valve will close later uh, than the aorta, and that will cause a splitting of the S2. Now, uh, if we think about the case of an atrial septal defect, uh, it's not only with breathing in that we have an increased venous return. Now that there is a, with every beat, blood flowing down that pressure gradient from the left atrium into the right atrium with every beat. So now every beat, we have an increased amount of blood in the right ventricle and an increased amount of blood flowing out into the pulmonary artery. That means with every beat now, instead of just with breathing in, we have a splitting of the S2. And that's a very important symptom and a very important uh, physiology concept that you should be aware of. Uh, another thing to note, uh, you'll also have a uh, systolic ejection murmur. And why is that? It's because, again, because of this increased uh, amount of blood uh, flowing this way into the right ventricle, uh, there's an increased amount of blood flowing past that uh, pulmonic valve out of the uh, right ventricle, and that causes that systolic ejection murmur, best heard in the pulmonic area. And then how do we evaluate these patients? Again, uh, echo is going to be the gold standard. And another concept that you should be aware of is um, thinking about O2 saturations in the different chambers in the setting of a heart defect. So um, again, let's explain some physiology here. Uh, we have this nice oxygenated blood that's just come out of the lungs in the left atrium, and now it's flowing again down the pressure gradient into the right atrium and uh, mixing with deoxygenated blood. But since uh, we have a little bit of oxygen from the blood coming uh, on the left side, we'll actually note that there's an increased uh, O2 saturation now in the right atrium. And uh, that will remain true uh, as the blood flows into the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery as well. So if you were to measure the O2 concentration uh, in the right atrium or the right ventricle of an ASD patient uh, compared to a normal patient, they would actually have an increased uh, O2 saturation. Uh, so that's uh, definitely something to be aware of. And uh, how do we treat these patients? Luckily, uh, most ASDs will resolve spontaneously uh, without treatment. So if you ever get a question about a patient with an ASD asking about treatment, uh, chances are that um, there's not going to be any treatment, that you just need to watch and wait and make sure that the uh, defect closes on its own. Uh, but there are some indications for surgery. Like I mentioned uh, earlier, um, the patient being symptomatic, usually that's good enough to make you think that they might need surgery. Uh, but additionally, if they're less than a year old with pulmonary hypertension, that's an indication for surgery. And again, if they're symptomatic uh, and you did the watch and wait, watch and wait approach, um, but they're now an older child with a large defect, uh, that's an indication for surgery as well.